Good. Cool. Yeah. Did, did you design it? I uh, don't know, really. I just chose to show you a, a bunch of them. You say like this and that. You know? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> mm. Do you pronounce it Cillian? Killian. Killian. Yeah. Killian. Killian. I should know that being 50% Irish. Yeah. Are you 50% Irish? Yeah. I'm French Irish. Mm. My husband always said there should be a law against the French and the Irish merging, mm. much less having children. <laughs> <laughs> Far too volatile. Yeah. yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> well, Neil, we're just going to get a little too shot here for establishment, but sure. it gives me the opportunity to say to you how much I enjoyed breakfast on Pluto. Well, thank you. Thank very, you very, much. very much. Excellent direction. Thank Good you. Good script. Uh, wonderful cast. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Many of whom you've worked with before, and, and I guess we'll work again in the future. I've worked with them all before, I think. All of them, really? All of them, except for uh, the Gavin Friday, who plays the singer. You know yes. The band. Most, most of them, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, uh, of course, set in Ireland. Yep, yep. And, uh, and you still make your home there, don't you? I live there, yeah. I yeah. Do. I live in Ireland, yeah. In Dublin? Yeah. In Dublin, yeah. Yes. Mm. And um, uh, actually, when did you shoot this film? The film, about uh, a year ago. Oh. Shot it in Ireland and London, and yeah, yeah, about a year ago. With Killian Murphy before, uh, before he did um, Batman and Red Eye and that sort of stuff, you know. So ah. he was kind of unknown. He had done that movie 28 Days Later, which everybody saw here, I think, yeah. And, uh, but, excuse me, sorry. He, he was, um, you know, he, he, when I finished the script, I tested all the young Irish actors around to see who could play the part, and Killian just gave this amazing performance. Okay, fine. Okay. You're wrong. All right. So, uh, to pick up where we left off, uh, mm. tell me how you, uh, how you happened to cast Killian Murphy. Well, I mean, I'd written this part very flamboyant, very, uh, you know, very kind of outside the mainstream, very feminine man living in Ireland, going to searching for his family and his mother and all that sort of stuff. And I, uh, I just had to find out was somebody out there who could play the role, really. And uh, you know, it's so I tested all of the young Irish actors that were around. This is about three or four years ago, and Killian came in and gave this amazing performance. So from then on, I knew well. I knew two things. I, I knew the part was playable, and I knew he he should play it. What were you looking for when you tested all these young actors? Uh, but what, what did you have to say, uh, we need this, we need that, and we don't need this? Well, it would have been very easy to make it, uh, to turn it into a high camp kind of, uh, kind of uh, festival of camp, basically, you know. And I wanted somebody to get into the soul of the character. I wanted somebody to get the innocence and the vulnerability of that character and bring it right, make that the forefront of the performance. I, I really needed somebody who could just make the character come alive in a very real way, you know. As far as the look of the person, mm -hmm. did you know what you wanted in the look of the person? Yeah, I did. I wasn't, sh you know, I mean, it's, it, I really was just looking for somebody to, because when you, when you cast these movies and when you work with actors, you've got to work from the inside out, really, you know. So to be saying, I need somebody that looks like this, or looks like that, or looks like the other, is kind of misleading. You just have to find somebody who, who will be able to enter the skin of the character and make them become almost like a real person, you know? Were any of the actors or any of the people you looked at, were they transvestites? No, nobody was, no. You weren't interested in that? I don't think so. That? No, not really, no. I wasn't, I, I didn't come at, I come at it from that point of view, really, you know? It was, um, I mean, I knew it had to be a huge acting job, you know. I knew it had to be an enormously complicated, engaging. I knew it, had, it would demand an enormous amount of whoever played it, you know. So it had to be an actor, really. I liked your format, Neil. I liked yeah. the chapter headings. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, uh, has that ever been done before that way? I don't know, really. Maybe. I I've never I seen really it. Don't, no, I've never seen it. Well, I mean, I, I really wanted to make the movie 38 small movies, you know. Rather than working a three-act structure the way Hollywood movies do, I just wanted to make it, um, you know, I, the book was written in tiny little chapters, the movie is episodic, a combination of all those elements led me to, um, you know, to, to deciding on the form that we chose, you know, where the 
different. It's, it, and it's a diary. The book, the, the, the movie is a diary, you know, written as a diary. You uh, have uh, Liam Neeson in it in a wonderful yeah. role of the priest. Yes. And uh, Stephen Ray. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it's kind of like your own little repertory company, isn't it? Um, it's turned out that way, really. I mean, it's, it's sort of this film because there were so many characters, there's about five or six characters who come in to, to the young boy's life, basically, and either protect him or abuse him, but they come in as either monsters, a father figure, as a mentor, as of some kind, you know. So I was able to ask a lot of people I'd worked with before to do a lot of cameos, you know. To people who say it's reminiscent of the crying game, uh, well, it, it obviously is, but it, it's more reminiscent to me of The Butcher Boy, you know? The movie I made a few years ago called The Butcher Boy, which was, um, uh, again, a portrait of an Irish childhood based on a novel by the same writer. To people who say it's reminiscent of The Crying Game, I just say it's kind of accidental, really, you know? It's not like I, uh, I have a genre all to myself to do with cross-dressing and terrorism. No, it's not really that, you know? For you, what was the major challenge of doing this film? The major challenge of doing the film was to get the, really to revisit the kind of landscapes of the, the themes that I dealt with in so many other movies, you know, to revisit them from the perspective of the central character, you know, that was the major challenge for me. Things I'm, such as? Well, it's political violence, you know, religion, uh, the kind of uh, the s the oppression of a small town Irish environment, the you know sexuality, gender confusion, stuff like that. But to to revisit them all through the through the through the point of through the lens of this character, which was kind of rose tinted, very beautiful, very innocent. That was the major challenge for me. The music in your films. Mm. Uh, Th that, that's always a major thing about your films, the music you mm. select. And we have a local tie-in in that on the soundtrack there is the Fort Worth Symphony. Oh yeah, singing, singing what exactly? I'm not sure because I just got it and I didn't have a chance to listen to it. Must be Zadok the Priest. That must be the Fort Worth Symphony. I didn't realize that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow, great, okay. Yeah. Now, how did that happen? Well, I needed a bit of choral music towards the end of the film, you know, and I chose this piece by Handel, which is wonderful. And it was, um, it, it happened to be recorded by the Fort Worth Symphony. <laughs> Just discovered that. <laughs> Amazing facts, huh? How much time do you spend with the music? Well, I put together the music, the soundtrack for this myself, really, you know, and it was, uh, I really had to revisit all those tunes of the 70s that were, and I, I didn't even use any of the really kind of, um, what would you call, the really, um, the really iconic tracks, the, I mean, I didn't use any Beatles, I didn't use any David Bowie, I didn't use any Led Zeppelin, probably because I couldn't afford them, but uh, it's, um, it was a matter, really, of you know finding a soundtrack to Kitten's world, you know, finding a playlist, almost like a play personal playlist, like we do now through an iPod, really. So I, you know, I found great songs by Harry Nielsen, by Dusty Springfield, by you know a whole range of people that were really quite um, you know personal to the character. And what percentage of your budget is for music clearance then? Oh, it, I mean, in the end, I didn't use a score, so in the end, we spent as much as we would have spent on a score, about 400,000, 500,000 on music. Do you ever score a movie or have Oh, it? yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of my movies I score. Interview the Vampire, The Crying Game was scored, The Butcher Boy, you know, most films I do score. Okay. Well, Neil, again, I thank you for coming to Dallas. Okay. And giving us this opportunity to talk with you and to share your film with our audience. Okay. And um, again, I give it four stars. I really okay. like this film. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Goodbye now. Now he's going to stay because oh, yeah. he I has to. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're rolling. How did you happen to cast Killian Murphy in the lead role? I'll answer it again, yeah? 
Okay, well, I met him for a test room four years ago in the cinema, and uh, he that, gave this amazing good. performance. That's okay, enough. sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. When you were looking at all of these people to play the lead role, the transvestite, what were you looking for? I was looking for a sense of inner beauty, I think. Okay. Quick one second. It's, it's all fine. It's just a little perfectionism here. You're rolling, Bobby. Okay. Among the people you looked at, were any of them transvestites? None. None of them. They were all actors. All of them. Was there any special physical look that you wanted? Uh, I just wanted somebody who was, could be very feminine, really, I think. You do so much with music. How much of your time and budget was spent on selecting the music? About 400,000. Among the music you selected is something by the Fort Worth Symphony. How did that happen? Well, I didn't know about that at the <laughs> time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. Okay. To people who say that this movie, Breakfast on Pluto, reminds them of the crying game, what are you saying? What am I saying to them? What do I say? Oh, it's, well, it's just accidental, really, I think. Okay. All right. Um, Okay. Um, I didn't ask you this, but let me just do it now and just sure, give me a complete sure. answer. Um, Jay Davidson, who was your star in The Crying Game, yeah. has he gone on to have a successful career? No, he's, he's abandoned films entirely. He never wanted to make films, really, you know, so he stopped. He just made that one and stopped? He made one other film and stopped, yeah. And how do you explain that? I don't know. Just, he was a non-actor, he experienced it, he enjoyed it, and he decided to abandon it, really. Oh, that's... Bizarre, but that's the truth. Does that make you sad, in a way? Um, I haven't met Jay for a long time, but it does make me a bit sad, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's, he can find fulfillment of his life without being in movies. But that was such an unforgettable performance. I know, it was, yeah. Anyway, there. But of course, you were the one who brought the performance out. I think so. Well, no, he had it in himself, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do it, you know. But with your help and your direction. I hope, I think yeah. so, yeah. But, you know, if when you cast a non-actor, that's, you know, sometimes they choose to follow that career, sometimes they don't, you know. Well, that is interesting. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay.